<laughs> anyway, good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to um, Espacio Telefónica. I'm Andres Pérez Peruca, and I am involved in a lot of work here. I've got Alberto, uh, 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 who is director of the festival, and uh, I'd like to thank you for coming along here. As you said, we were the f you phoned us and we went along to see you, and we have. You said we had a great new project, and uh, we thought that you absolutely had to be here uh, with a great project. Uh, so I think we've really fitted in fairly well to the project, and uh, we thought it was important to be involved with you uh, in this with this week and this. Uh, uh, so this is uh, an event which is. Uh, very important and ident identifies uh, a lot about virtual reality, etc. And uh, on extended virtual reality and design and everything. So I think this is really a very new subject and is a very, something that is not very explored. So we have our exhibition as well uh, on. I can tell you the dates. It's opens on the 22nd of February and uh, you can enjoy it until the 23rd of April. Uh, so there's plenty of time. We try to make everything as easy as possible. We are uh, look the same. We've dressed virtually the same and we're not going to uh, talk too long. So that's about all I want to say. Thank you very much to La Fabrica and thank you uh, to you for coming along. My geez, uh, from my the Sound Festival, and uh, we hope you'll enjoy the session. Hello, hi. As Andres said, it's true right from the first moment at La Fabrica, we've been lucky enough to work with Fundación Telefónica basically right from the start, uh, from the beginning of uh, their activity with Foto España and the first edition. That's when we started. Uh, I think we're the only uh, organization that have been uh, linked to the festival right from the start. So uh, this has allowed us to have a continuous relationship and uh, have a firm relationship, an ongoing relationship with the Telefonica Foundation. We have a great uh, relationship with them. So the festival had in this was clear that in this first edition we needed the collaboration and support of some strategic partners to be able to set up all this programming. We had about three weeks of uh, work starting with the exhibitions, the inauguration, and where we were organizing professional sessions last week as well. Uh, and there was a very long uh, series of presentations and projects, inaugurations. Uh, here and out in the street, as it were, in other locations. So now we want to go into the technology part. Uh, we have several activities to talk about. Really, the, in the foundation, we felt that because of what we normally do, we should um, place a lot of effort on a programming that fitted into our theme with the philosophy of the of Telefonica Foundation, and uh, not just organize basic meetings, but also bring in lots of other activities programmed by the foundation, which um, has been fully involved. There'll be a session on Wednesday, on, which is very interesting, and Jennifer Steinkamp uh, is one of the most interesting visual proposals uh, uh, that we have organized. So on this project of superhumanity, we've had the opportunity to talk and uh, prepare, get ready for uh, through with uh, Beatrice and Mark through the festival. We're delighted to ha have uh, their confidence and have brought this project to Madrid for us. So we are really interested in this question of uh, design, the interest of uh, the experience of the user, present and future. Uh, this uh, uh, this claim to redesign the world is fascinating. So it's great to be able to tackle it from such an innovative uh, standpoint as superhumanity. So I will simply give the uh, the floor to the coordinator of the sessions um, uh, and uh, then we'll be we'll get stuck into superhumanity okay thank you very much uh, 
Andreas Lucas. Uh, uh, thank you, and thanks to all the people who've made this possible. This, uh, these two sessions, Teresa, uh, through Design Week, and all of you for coming. So I think something like humor, super humanity, should be organised here in Telefonica. This had a lot of sense because this is one of these main centres of communications because one of the key elements of the major element that we're going to deal with today and tomorrow has to do with how communications deals with the design and redesign and how we de redesign human beings. So we're going to have some events which are perhaps a little bit promiscuous or polyamorous as it were uh, where we'll be starting uh, arithmetically to grow uh, in terms of speakers and also in uh, outlooks. So we'll first we'll have a presentation from Are We Human, the project which a lot of the ideas came from which form part of human, superhumanity. This will be presented by Mark Wigley and Beatriz Colomina and then we'll have immediately after that the presentation of the book Superhumanity and we'll have Nicolas Hirsch and Nick Axel and then we will have also Ingo Nierman uh, in the round table. So we We'll have some of our debates and discussions on this, this, what this design is, is all about, how, what is, how the redesign, uh, does the design, the new design as it were. So we'll have a lot of discussions, uh, on the human insect and a lot of, uh, round tables that are stratified around different elements of this social, um, net network, selfies, etc. where we'll have artists, architects, philosophers, etc. writers, Fru Fru and various Fernando For uh, Forta and many other figures. So I'll simply give you the floor, give the floor to Mark and Beatrice. Thank you very much. Uh, you want to sit here or here? Hello. Thank you very much for, for coming. We are super happy to be part of uh, this event here in, in Telefonica. I was born in Madrid, but I'm told not to say a word in Spanish because I either speak in Spanish or in English the whole time, so I'm sorry about that. But uh, you want to say something? No. Yeah? So, then we go. Yeah, but also just to 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 thank Ivan, and, and uh, we are very excited about this uh, congress here tomorrow with very very crazy people, mainly curated by I Ivan. We would like to demonstrate that the most radical thinking about social media architecture is Spanish, and why <laughs> why it is that social media. Uh, for example, if you go to the beach in Spain, you can see always a circle of six women. They are swimming in a perfect circle, like a kind of Russian constructivist artwork. They float in a perfect circle. All six are talking at the same time. Uh, all six are listening to everything that has been said. And then the circle slowly comes towards the beach, and the circle will walk across the beach. And you know perfectly what I'm talking about. Behind that circle is a group of men, also all talking, but not, not so interesting and not so uh, geometric. So it's possible that social media is a, is a kind of Spanish... Uh, invention, and we are interested in the architecture of that, so we feel sure tomorrow we, we learn some secrets about uh, social media. <laughs> okay, but today actually we are going to uh, talk about this uh, little book uh, here, uh, Are We uh, Human? And that came out, uh, it's not a catalog, but a book that we wrote in, in parallel at the same time that we were preparing for the Biennale uh, in, Istanbul, in Istanbul on the question of uh, of are we are we human? The design of the of the species. And uh, we thought we thought this project will be like a kind of a mirror. You saw before 300 images of um, what could be human. We think yes, it is human. It is strange, the human. And I don't know about you, but when I look into the mirror. Uh, it's not such a, a pleasant experience uh, because I'm not sure what it is that I see in the mirror. I have become very familiar with this thing that I see in the mirror. I know that thing is me, but I do not know uh, really what it is. So when you have, a, have an exhibition called Are We Human? It is really a, a kind of a, uh, a, a kind of a, a, a mirror. So we make a, an exhibition that is a, is a mirror. And I think if you make a mirror of the human species, it's very, very strange what you will see. 
could even be uh, f frightening, that we, we really do not want to see what the human being uh, has become. So we did this uh, kind of uh, research, this question for over a year, uh, before we write this uh, really kind of polemical uh, manifesto of mm -hmm. uh, eight propositions, and ask people in the... Um, in the Biennale to respond to uh, the propositions. Uh, our starting point was, uh, and I don't know how you changed, you have yeah. the thing to change yeah. there, so you have to change. I just did. Ah, you did. Uh, <laughs> our starting point was that uh, the sign always presents itself as serving uh, the human, this is the typical definition of, uh, of design, uh, but uh, in fact this real ambition is to redesign um, the human. And to put it in a in a really uh, simple uh, way, here I'm showing we are showing you some footprints of uh, Neolithic uh, inhabitants of what is now uh, known as uh, Istanbul, about 8,500 uh, years ago. These were actually discovered where they were digging uh, for the subway, and uh, it's kind of a funny story because. Um, he delay, of course, the work of the subway and then President mm -hmm. Erdogan said, but don't they care about the, all this archaeology? Don't they care about the humans? Right? So they care uh, about the humans, but he obviously didn't care about these 8,500 uh, years uh, humans. Uh, that, as you can see, because of the smooth outline of the footprint, it's not actually the, the footprint, but it's actually the imprint of a shoe. Therefore, it's the imprint already of uh, human uh, technologies. Uh, our argument will be like shoes, or just to give an example, transform the capacity and behavior and even the skeleton of the human. Uh, the human uh, was redesigned uh, by the shoe. Here you have, for example, uh, Rudowski. Uh, the famous uh, uh, Austrian uh, architect and designer uh, who in the 1940s already criticized the typical Western uh, uh, man uh, shoe. Of course, he criticized most famously women's shoe and the way they were uh, somehow uh, destroying the feet of women. But he also criticized the, the typical Oxford uh, male shoe and argued that if we keep going that way, we will end up developing a, a big toe uh, in the in the middle, so that is uh, is the point that shoes uh, actually transform uh, our uh, uh, bodies. And next, and here are the footprints of Neil Armstrong on the on the moon that, as you know, were made possible by a massive technological apparatus. So. Uh, only humans uh, uh, could make themselves a shoe and then send themselves up to the moon. The sign in our argument is what makes us uh, humans rather than the other way mm -hmm. uh, around. This, by the way, is, is, a, is a drawing. It is looking like an Andy Warhol drawing, but really it is a drawing produced by 200 people playing a game, and this game is to try to figure out the exact geometry uh, of the neurons in the brain. So this is actually the most scientific image, uh, uh, the most precise image of the connectome, which is the kind of forest of, of interconnections in your brain. It is amazing that when you walk the streets of Madrid now, you have the design festival saying, uh, you know, redesigning the world. Uh, by the way, it's true. We, we have redesigned the world. We redesigned the weather. We design our children. We design everything. We design relationships. We design politics. But the reason we show you this image is even when I'm talking to you now, the connectons inside my head are cha changing a little bit their organization. So we even redesign the brain. So does it, design is not something that happens in your head and then you change the world. Design is something strange between the world and you and the first thing that gets redesigned, the most important thing that gets redesigned is the human. The human is that species that has been redesigning itself uh, for 200,000 years. Maybe with me, go back. Uh, the, actually, this is part of the research of uh, an important neuroscientist, Sebastian Son uh, at Princeton University. And the connectome uh, is, is precisely this, uh, this question, this idea, that for every thought you have, uh, your brain is already changing. For a long time, we thought that the brain was, uh, was fixed. And, and now we know that we are constantly redesigning uh, or our own uh, uh, brains. So, so, so simply to think and to talk is to design yourself already. Uh, again, this would be for us as a mirror image. You are look, looking at yourself. Not, not so easy to understand. This is also 
looking at yourself, that there is not a part of the landscape which is not uh, designed. Even the Antarctic is completely uh, 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 designed. The, the, the pattern of our movement on, on the water, uh, this is the uh, movements and interconnections of humans without any geography. If you come from a country that's not important, like me, New Zealand, you can see it very easily because there's not many connections. So you see that the only people that arrive in New Zealand arrive by ship, so they hit the land and then they bounce off. So you, you see the territory. If you come from somewhere like Spain, which is important, you cannot see. Because you're just a density, a density of, of uh, interconnections. And then you, uh, we are looking down. This is the human species. This is not the work of the human or the result of the human. This is uh, the planet has been uh, redesigned by the human. Again, this is the human. This is design. If you are coming to Earth from Mars, if you are a creature from Mars, and you would hit a piece of uh, space junk, you wouldn't say to yourself, Ah, I found a piece of uh, design. Let me, let me find the species that designed it. You would immediately say, Ah, new species. And if you would go come to Earth, you wouldn't come to us and say, Here is the human. You, maybe you go into the genome. Or maybe you go into the laws and the regulations and the patterns. You would probably conclude that the human is a kind of ecology uh, of design, a huge e ecology. Uh, well, what you just saw is, yeah. the is a depiction of the junk that is uh, uh, circling around the, uh, the Earth, all these pieces of satellite and all this junk that was uh, left behind by a uh, different uh, operation. I don't know what we are. And it is another satellite, but this time on the inside of the body. Mm -hmm. This is, I don't know if any of you have this artificial heart valve. Mm -hmm. Probably we will all have one of these. Mm -hmm. If you have one of these, are you human or are you a machine? Right? You are superhuman because only a human, only a superhuman has, ha has this piece of technology, this spaceship on the inside. Mm -hmm. So the spaceships are on the outside in outer space but are also on the inside. What you think of as your body is suspended between different technologies, like your inside uh, technology. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe this is the single biggest artwork we have produced. This is the Horizon Hall, right? Another circle. Uh, are we so proud that we have made this? Everybody is saying uh, it's a horrible climate change. What a disaster. But even the people who say what a disaster, they have a little bit of uh, arrogance also. We humans have managed to make the destruction of the world. But they don't really mean the destruction of the world. They mean the destruction of the human. We are the species that is about to... I don't know, extinguish itself. Extinguish ourselves, right? <laughs> so, next. So, in fact, this is uh, actually something very distinctive about the human species. We may be uh, the only species to have systema systematically designed its own uh, extinction. Other species might have managed to uh, design the extinction of other species, but we have uh, accomplished even further. We are uh, uh, on our way uh, happily to uh, uh, accomplish uh, this ultimate uh, goal. So in a way what we tried with the Biennale was then a uh, reboot uh, uh, the conversation, so to speak, by uh, rethinking the intimate relationship between the sign and the, and the human. So that's the question, are we human, which is a question about the we. Right, the we of this. Uh, of course, this project. Uh, once you ask this question, it, it doesn't uh, stop. It's a kind of a, a permanent question. Uh, the exhibition kept going. We did another version of the exhibition in Princeton, and in Princeton, the exhibition was in the bathroom. By the way, the bathroom probably much more important space to think about the design of the human than a lecture theatre like this one. If this conversation was going on in the toilets, it would be a more serious conversation, right? No question. Uh, but anyway, the conversation would be in the bathrooms, in the hallways, in the basements, in the elevators, in the gardens, in the courtyards, in the auditoria, in the surgery rooms, in the mortuaries, in the lounges, in the studios, when you are sleeping, when you're in the airplane, when you are flying. In, in every moment, there would be some new kind of conversation. Maybe this question, are we human, is a bit like a virus, right? And once you, once you think about this question, and, in, in, and importantly, the question keeps going in a kind of yellow virus, as you can see. The little yellow book gives way to a bigger yellow book that the Nick and Nicholas will talk about uh, later with many, many writers. So we thought that today, we, Beatrice and I, we will present a little presentation 
like academics, we are academics, so we do a little academic presentation of a book. Then uh, uh, Nick and Nicholas will present a superhumanity book, and then we have a, a surprise uh, guest. Just to warn you from the uh, 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 beginning, some some kind of uh, uh, warning signs uh, about why we do this book. Well, uh, in many ways, we try to undermine everything that the Biennale uh, stands for. In in a way, we hate Biennale, so it was kind of. Uh, a strange thing that we even accepted the, the commission to uh, take the, the Biennale of Istanbul, but particularly we uh, uh, were very much against the figure of the of the curator. Uh, we thought that the show and the catalog uh, should uh, actually feature uh, the voices of all the participants, and and we put all everything every thought that we have in a separate book. So instead of the typical catalog uh, with uh, our introduction and some higher guns to produce some kind of uh, mm. uh, overwhelming uh, essays trying to explain the work of the in the exhibition we ask the people in the exhibition to speak for themselves and we put our thoughts in a, in a separate uh, book but in fact as Mark says we are not going to talk about the catalog of the ex or the exhibition uh, uh, today we are going to talk about this uh, 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 little book uh, uh, the Argu Ar Human, the Archaeology of the Sign, which is in our mind also an archaeology of curiosity. It's not simply about the history of the human animal as revealed in the multiple uh, uh, layers of artifacts. It uncovers in our view the sedimented ways of reinventing uh, the human. And as Mar said, we are going to give you a test of the, of the book by looking at the 200,000 uh, years uh, of the subtitle. Uh, with the idea of the plastic human, and Mark will mm -hmm. talk about that. And I will talk about the last, uh, let's say, 200 years uh, with modernity and the idea of the anesthetics of the science. So the idea is the aesthetics of modernity are, in fact, an anesthetic. Anesthetic? Yeah. Yeah, doesn't make any sense because it's an aesthetic, but no, I mean an aesthetic in the sense of, uh, in Spanish, you know, anesthesia. Anesthesia, anesthesia, yeah. So the same. Anesthesia. No? Anesthesia. Okay, so now we, now we become academics, but old-fashioned, we, we do a book reading, because of course in a super digital social media age, the paradox is we are believing very much in, in, the book. in, in, in books, and if we believe in books, maybe eventually we could believe in design, and if we believe in design, maybe we could be even believe in architecture, and we teach architecture, right? So a small academic uh, speech from the book. To, to, be, to warn you, this is not a design manual, so if you would like to be a good designer, uh, don't buy this, uh, especially because the main idea of this book is that good design is not good. Good design is a bad idea, right? We got to the ozone layer with a good design. Right? Good design is what gave us the ability to destroy ourselves. So we're interested in a design that might not be good, uh, nor is it a, a, a good book for people who want to be better humans. If you go to a bookstore, you say, tell me all the books you have which are to make the human a better human. It's like half the books, right? If you want to have a million selling book, you make a book on how to be better human. This is not a good book if you want to be uh, a better human. This is actually quite a good book if you would like to be a little bit less uh, good human. Uh, it's possible, by the way, that somebody that's not very human could be a very good designer. Did you ever, by the way, meet a good designer who was also a good human? Right? Maybe a problem. You know, you know, designers look like humans. They really do. Right? From, from a distance, you would say a designer is, is, is human. It's only when they start to talk that you realize, no, it's something else. Because this person, the designer, thinks that the object is talking and thinks that the object is communicating aspirations. So designers are people that think that objects talk. Right? So how can we make objects that talk about the human differently? Right, it's a bit more, more, more urgent, more, more important. So I read you a section from the from the from the plastic human. Human is an unstable category, even an unstable being. It's not a clearly defined biological organism with a particular form and a particular set of capacities that collaborates with social networks and so on. On the contrary, the human is defined by its diversity and its plasticity. Uh, its ability to modify its own abilities. It is the plasticity of the human, the ability of the human to be something else, to be something other than human, that makes it actually in the end human. And it is this ability to be something else, to, to change, 
That is the reason that the human has such an enormous impact on the world. In fact, you can say almost as a formula, the more plastic the human is, the more you can change the human, the more the human can change, the more impact that it would have. In redesigning ourselves, we redesign the planet. It's not that we sit there and say, let's redesign the planet. It's in, in the process of designing ourselves, we invent a new planet. And this is the real plasticity that is human. So what am I saying? That what makes the human human is not inside your body and it's not inside your brain. By the way, you don't want to know what's inside your brain. Or do, do you want to know what's really inside the brain of your father? Really? Everything? No. Right? We don't want, want, want to know. It's not even inside the collective social body. There's not a kind of a secret uh, human quality inside social organization. Really what's, where it is inside is in the very strange relationship that we have with objects. That objects are for us not simply outside of our body, but part of our body and our brain. The human is something suspended between objects and the animal. And the human is in this kind of continuous backwards and forwards between ourselves and the objects that we think that we, we make. A kind of vibration or a kind of a flickering relationships. In fact, the objects that we make have more agency, have more ideas and more uh, uh, political effects than we that think that we have produced those uh, uh, objects. We are transformed by the objects that we design just as much as they are transformed by us. Or to say it the other way around, the body, the human body and the human brain have been designed. They are like design artifacts. So what is really human in the end is just how radical this is, this sort of radical relationships. So artifacts, objects, like uh, this object, this object is not uh, coming from some idea in somebody's head and then made in glass. Actually, the person who was making this for the first time was not sure what they were making and became a different person when they were making it and is in love with the glass and in love with making things in glass because they become themselves when they make them. So a glass artist is not somebody who makes art with glass, it's somebody that uses glass to make themselves. All of you are probably in some sense artists and you know exactly this feeling. The reason you do the work you do is not because you do it, because it does you, right? And this is the human thing. Artifacts are therefore, this is part of my body, part of my brain, but also at the same time part of your body and brain. This is an idea, this is a thought. Uh, but equally, the glass is the possibility of new ways of thinking, new actions in the world, right? So it's a potential for new uh, thoughts. If this is the case, then the history of design is not the history, a kind of heroic history going from the first tools to the most sophisticated uh, computers. It's not about the steady evolution of a kind of singular creature that develops more and more skills. Rather, it's a history of, the quest of a question mark. The human is that species which says to itself, what am I? And answers this question in making objects, objects which make a new person which asks a new question. So the history of design is a history of uh, uh, questions. Okay, next question is where I go. It's true that most British men are boring. It's true. Uh, but every now and then, especially when seen from Spain, but every now and then you will get two very crazy British men that make a difference. And here is Joseph Pritzwich and, and John Evans. One is a geologist, an expert in the layers of, of the ground, and the other one is an uh, archaeologist, expert in the history of human objects. And what they're famous for is making an argument that links the layers of the ground to the layers of human objects. On May 26 and June 2, 1859, geologist Joseph Pretwich and archaeologist John Evans gave matching papers, kind of twin papers, to two societies in London, the Royal Society and the Society of Antiquities. That is to say, the most severe scientific bodies of that time. They said that some stones that they had found, looking like this, uh, in France and England, exhibited all of the qualities of design. They said, of this object, there is a uniformity of shape, a correctness of outline, and a sharpness about the cutting edges and points which cannot be due to anything other than design. So they say, here's a piece of stone, 
and it is clearly a piece of human design. The problem is this stone was found in geological layers next to animals thought to be extinct long before the human. So either these are human objects by design, in which case the human has been around for many, many more hundreds of thousands of years than thought possible, or it's coming from some kind of alien. By the way, that was the dominant theory, that these objects were produced by aliens. Um, these objects were produced by what Pritchwitz called blows by design, like shaped by design. He insisted that his argument did not depend on evidence of skill. It's not that you look at this and say, wow, it has been well made, but on evidence of design. The objects were not just made, they were thought. Somebody was thinking this object to produce it. They held the object in their hand while they were giving the lectures. They felt its weight. They made drawings of it. They held it in their own hands. They kind of stared at the object. They felt the way that the object changed their own body. They imagined themselves to be at the beginning of humanity, and the beginning of humanity being the beginning of technology. They think that this is the oldest technology. Without ever having to say it, their theory was that if you have design, then you have human. In other words, for them, the human is a designer. Now, it was only uh, six months later that in the same city of London, Charles Darwin would publish his most controversial book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. And as you know, the main idea of this book is to say that humans are are not uh, the product of some kind of god that is a designer, that there is that the, the design is actually not produced by a, a kind of a single brain, uh, that clearly defined organisms with very clearly defined functions. He uses the human eye. Most people were looking at this and saying, this is so complex and so beautiful that there must have been a designer, must have been a god. He says that all of the beauty in this image comes not from a designer, but from the absence of design, from thousands upon thousands of mutations and variations that ultimately lead to this. Millions of minute variations in millions of minute elements over millions of years. In other words, Darwin's main point of view was that the world has produced, it has the effect of design without a designer. Right? And these arguments were incredibly important. Uh, the very first publication uh, of these uh, old uh, ancient uh, uh, objects, uh, these, these uh, hand axes as they were called, uh, in fact occurred in 1800 in England. And he, he, a guy dug up in his, in, his, in his back garden, he dug up a hand axe and said this is clearly a sign of, of that the humans were around for thousands and thousands of years longer than we thought. Nobody believed him, so much so that even his article was published in the minutes of the Royal Society, but it was totally ignored. It was ignored until the 1860s, when an extremely crazy French guy, who had been, by, by the way, just so you know, uh, Darwin thought that if with my hand I can use a hand axe and kill somebody, I will survive. So if I have a hand that's very good for holding a hand axe, I will survive more. So if I can make a hand axe, eventually the bones in my body will change shape in order to be good hands for holding a hand axe. In other words, Darwin says that the design of a tool will change the hand of the designer. This theory, very, very controversial theory, was proved only four years ago when they found Homo habilis. This is a, this is a, a hand that's very good for hanging in the tree and very good for throwing stones. So this theory is finally confirmed. That is to say, the idea that we are redesigned by our tools, as Beatrice says, that, that our feet would even be redesigned by our shoes, was confirmed by these uh, discoveries. And this is the little bone that's the bone that's very good for throwing things that is coming from our uh, tools. There it is in your hand. Okay. This is the exact stone that was found in 1800 that was thought to be designed but was too radical. The big change happens here. Here you see two men pointing to a stone sticking out the side of a hill. This is a stone that is pulled out, looks like this. And this stone is so exciting that the two, that, that, that photograph was taken and the two Englishmen go back to London and present this object. Of course, it's not a very beautiful object. It's an object kind of in production. So they have to argue in front of the Royal Society that this is the evidence of design. And of course, they were successful because the moment they said that this was a design object, thousands of such objects were produced. So many of these objects were produced that Charles Darwin said, I don't believe this idea. Darwin said, if, if humans were making these objects, then they would have no time to do anything other than make these objects, therefore it's not true. It turns out 
that that's exactly what the human species was doing. 90% of its time was devoted to making these objects and making the same object in the same way, uh, it turns out, for more than a million years. Why? If you have a hand axe like this, firstly, by the way, if you carry one of these, it's not very convenient. By the way, a symmetrical stone object is not better for killing someone. Right? It's actually difficult to hold. So this is actually functionally not very good. But if you are able to kill another animal, well, that's great. You can survive and have dinner and you'll be fine. But if nobody will have sex with you, it doesn't really matter how good your hand axe is. So the reason that the human was making these objects, the reason the human was designing these objects so beautifully is that you can say to a possible girlfriend, look at my hand axe. Look how beautifully it has been constructed. Uh, what genes I must have. So you could be a very attractive person by having a very attractive hand axe. And this, of course, is the principle of sexual selection. Half of Darwin's book is devoted to the fact that we choose also the shape of our own body. He says, for example, that the human has a naked skin. Naked skin is a bad idea in the summer and a bad idea in winter. But humans decided that nudity is sexy. So we designed ourselves. Darwin says we des the very first thing we designed was our nudity. So what develops is a very, very interesting argument. What I, what I tried to suggest with Beatrice in this book is that the whole point about design is that an object that looks like it works generally is a form of decoration. And an object that looks like it's decoration is often functional. For example, this is the first decoration. This is the oldest decoration. These are marine shells uh, which are painted and put around the neck. Uh, archaeologists disagree about absolutely everything. They love to fight, except for one thing. If you can find painted marine shells like this, this is the beginning of social media. This is the beginning of communication. These are referred to as media. If I have shells like this, then I can communicate to somebody who's living on the other side of the hill, somebody that's just a little bit enough like me that they could recognize me from this. I don't need to communicate to my family or to the people living in my village, but I could communicate to the next village. So actually what looks like decoration is the beginning of functional communication. And if the humans could communicate, that is to say, have sex with people on the other side of the hill, if we kept having sex wider and wider and wider, the human becomes then the species which is dispersed horizontally across the landscape. Then if we develop language and can communicate our ideas to the next generation, then we could keep doing very, very stupid things because basically Beatrice and I present the theory that what makes the human human is that we make tools that don't work, right? If you're having a design festival, you should be specializing in how to produce more things that don't work because that's our secret. If a bird learns how to get a worm out of a tree with a little stick like this, the bird will do that for the next two million years. Human being will do even the next day will be trying to do it differently. So we always do things wrong. We always make, we always think what could be different and every now and then one of the ideas we have about how to do it differently turns out to really work and we are really good at sharing ideas. So we are the social media species and as a result we developed a huge collective intelligence. So our ability to bring our own species to the, to the end of, 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 of extinction uh, comes from our ability to make objects uh, that don't work, and this is something not celebrated enough in design festivals, please. Uh, redesigning the world, let's make a stupid world, uh, uh, something like this. Uh, this is enough from me. Okay. You know, that's you, right? This is you, the stupid designer, right? Trying to have sex with somebody by making an object that doesn't work but looks good, right? That looks great, actually. <laughs> that's you, right? That's the, that's the most intense telephone part of the world, Africa, right? What he holds in his hand to check the price of the goods is not different from the hand axe developed in the very same, within 100 kilometers of this uh, photograph. All right, so I'll take the second part of it, which is uh, actually also in this book. Some other aspect of it that, as I said before, has to do with the idea that the aesthetics of uh, of uh, modernity are really an aesthetic. So an aesthetic design. Uh, okay, how do you pass this? Um, reading from here, no, the elimination of ornament, uh, for example, which you know very well is ar argued by architects like uh, Adolf Loos at the turn of the century, is not simply, as we have been told, an aesthetic uh, choice, but a neurological or even a narcotic uh, one, as I will try to demonstrate. Loos argues that we no longer have the nerves 
to eat, dress, and decorate as in previous centuries. Modern man has a whole new set of nerves with completely different sensitivities. He even gave this series of lectures uh, in uh, in Paris in 1926, all in uh, German, the man with the modern uh, uh, nerves. Ornament uh, and Crime, his most uh, famous uh, book, uh, which everybody has studied. In fact, he, he, in one of the most, for me, interesting par packages, Lost speaks of his horror in front of the decorated animals in culinary displays, particularly if he thinks he has to eat one of these uh, stuffed animal courses. And then he says, I only eat roast beef. Uh, so the abstraction of, uh, of meat. He feels the same nausea. And it's now actually something that he, he talks about in the face of excessive ornament, whether on food or on architecture. He says, we like the steady nerves to drink from an elephant ivory touch on which an Amazon battle scene has been engraved. So it's not that we don't like it, it's that we don't have the nerves anymore. So uh, the rejection of ornament is from that point of view a physiological uh, reaction as Lost himself put it in 1919. By 1921, he was already arguing that the whole biology of man has evolved to give modern man a whole new set of nerves. Those are his, his words. Modern man, he writes, the man endowed with a modern nervous system doesn't need ornament. You know, I mean, for me, it's really fascinating that this... Uh, Passages of Adolf Loos that are everywhere have been uh, actually uh, overlooked in favor of other uh, arguments about uh, ornament. In Karl Kraus, uh, Walter Benjamin quotes Robert Shaw. Robert Shaw actually was the uh, brother of Gustav uh, Shaw, also therefore very close to, to Loos, who uh, go, uh, Gustav Shaw was the client of Loos for this uh, beautiful uh, villa. Uh, very criticized, very polemical. Uh, in Vienna in 1912, what did they say? It was the void of ornament, precisely. Krauss uh, writes uh, uh, Robert Sir, and is then uh, written by Walter Benjamin, discover a great subject that have never before set in motion the pain of a journalist, the rise of the nerves. He became an advocate of the nerves, but the subject grew under his hand to become the problem of private life. So private life, the interior, becomes this uh, newly fragile, like the um, that of the nervous individual analyzed by psychoanalysis, or the vulnerable uh, body of the tuberculosis patient penetrated by x-ray. Everybody becomes like a child or a patient needing to grip up, wrap up in soft uh, lining, as if uh, it is as if the new nerves are so new that the modern individual has only just been born and needs a protective incubator to survive, to gain the necessary strength. Loss architecture, you can argue, is such an incubator. And this actually is a, a tuberculosis uh, patient in one of the sanatoria at the beginning of the century, all wrapped up in, uh, in white. Loss himself was also uh, fragile. He suffered from numerous nervous and physical ailments throughout his life, and at the end, he checked himself into a sanatorium run by his friend, the psychiatrist Do Dr. Schwarzman in Karlsburg, where he died in 1933. A year earlier, Bucky Fuller had included nerve shock uh, proofing, nerve shock proofing, uh, in his list of basic, basic requirements of a house. Again, not likely that you have heard about this uh, 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 nerve shock proofing as one of the uh, qualities that Bucky Fuller uh, was looking in his uh, houses. Uh, uh, of course, the whole uh, scene of the sanatoria in Vienna, it's not that Loss was checking himself in a nervous uh, sanatoria, they were all checking themselves in, in sanatoria. Uh, this is the Purkersdorf uh, outside uh, Vienna, uh, the famous building of, uh, of Hoffman where all the uh, uh, famous people of the time checked themselves all for the uh, for the nervous nervous problems Gustav Mahler Somber uh, the writer Hoffman style and even the architect Hoffman or Coleman Mosser, the designer of the uh, furniture, check themselves now and then. I, I have no idea what Coleman uh, Mosser was uh, was suffering from, but here you have in one uh, photograph of this uh, period, and of course uh, uh, the furniture that he designed for the Purkesdorf and uh, all this uh, white uh, uh, building with uh, uh, rectilinear, rectilinear uh, forms was uh, uh, sufficiently uh, strong as an idea to act as an effective uh, placebo 
uh, for the modern uh, uh, nerves, but I could deviate it a little bit here, and I will deviate even more to think about other Viennese uh, 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 historians and theorists of the time, like Camillo City, very famous for his uh, book of the uh, city planning, who argued that modern uh, architecture and modern cities, like for example the uh, cities that uh, Otto Wagner was uh, promoting with the rectilinear infinite uh, avenues were causing psychological uh, uh, problems in the inhabitants and new nervous disorders have been discovered including agoraphobia. So at the same time that agoraphobia is being treated by uh, psychoanalysts, uh, uh, architects and, and theorists are talking about these new nervous disorders caused, caused by modern architecture and as you know advocated uh, redesigning the city following more like medieval patterns in which the city itself becomes kind of an interior and protects this fragile and super nervous uh, modern uh, subject. Uh, it's not just a Vienna hang up, uh, to put it that way. If you read again Glass Architecture of Paul Server, it's interesting that he also says sanatoria will also want glass building. The influence of a splendid glass architecture on the nerves is indispensable. Okay? So, uh, this is in 1914. The whole thing, uh, actually continues, uh, strongly after, uh, uh the war. Uh, this is a cover of architectural uh, uh, review, and this is Arts and Architecture, the magazine where uh, people like uh, uh, Charles Andre Imps uh, 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 define uh, uh, or redefine the sign. How does Charles uh, uh, Andre Imps redefine the sign? They define the sign itself as a soap absorber. I mean, this is a, fa a fascinating definition of what design is, in, in my view. They have been themselves uh, involved during the war in the uh, military production of uh, this leg, splints, uh, and other body uh, cells for injured soldiers. Therefore, literally shock absorbers for a traumatized uh, uh, body. And immediately after the war, not only they recycle all this uh, uh, technology of plywood, etc., into their famous uh, potato chip chairs, etc., but they also uh, did their own uh, uh, house of steel and glass uh, house, and they write the house must not make insistent demands for itself, but rather uh, aid as a background for life in work. And then this is the punchline: I never hear such a definition of a house as a reorientator and a shock absorber. So the house itself is a reorientator, who is disoriented here, uh, and a shock absorber, what shock are we talking about? And of course, as you can see, even in the cover of the Arts and Architecture uh, magazine, of course, uh, uh, the shock is the shock of, of the war. The war. Um, domestic life could no longer be taken uh, for granted after uh, World War II. It became actually an art form uh, carefully constructed and marketed by a whole new industry, a form which you want of art therapy for a traumatized nation, a reassuring image of the good life to be bought like any other project. Uh, the shock in the post-war years is obviously the shock of uh, nuclear annihilation. Good design offers good life, a galaxy of happy, self-contained objects for people who do not feel safe, contained, self-contained, safely contained, and cannot be sure of life itself. The ink, and you can see in all the pictures, every time they did something, they photographed themselves with it, and every time, uh, they are smiling. They really perfected, and we will go back to this idea of the keep smiling, uh, later. They keep uh, uh, smiling. Perhaps no other designs can be smiling so often and so polemically, uh, particularly when you compare it with the uh, previous, uh, uh, here they are with the model of the first uh, uh, house they did, the Ames house, the Bridge house model. And they are photographing themselves with this new model as if it was a, a kind of a, a new baby, you know, like the, the kind of in, in, in totally entranced with this new thing they have just uh, uh, created. It's really fascinating if you compare to the previous uh, generation and particularly uh, here, for example, the Everest calling out of loss, but the same with uh, me. So, or with Le Corbusier, that they always look like they never smile about uh, anything. As I say, I will go back to the question of shock and, and, uh, and smiling uh, later. 
But let's uh, now move uh, to Le Corbusier. This is actually an image that Le Corbusier published himself in, uh, in one of his books. But before that, in the Street Nouveau, is the equipment of, uh, of a dentist. He is fascinated by all these uh, new uh, technology, uh, technologies and the spaces. And he talks also, Le Corbusier, about, about the smooth surfaces of modern architecture and modern design as an anesthetic to the nerves, in his words, satyr in the aftermath of war. At the same time that he is actually, he says that real anesthetic, cocaine, is being peddled in the streets of uh, Paris. Cocaine, of course, was one of the first uh, substances to use uh, in anesthesia for surgery uh, by Carl Kohler on the recommendation of Freud in 1884. The history of modern aesthetics uh, uncannily parallels that of modern uh, design. Or the history, I'm sorry, of, of modern anesthetics mm -hmm. is actually parallel to the hi history of modern uh, architecture and design. The first public uh, uh, demonstration of an operation under anesthesia, uh, this time was with ether, took place in uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital in 1846. Anesthesia, as you know, is the removal of feeling, the temporal suppression of the central nervous system in order to achieve lack of sensation. Aesthetics comes, and that may be surprising to you, come from the Greek and had everything to do with sensation, with perception by bodily feeling and nothing to do with the intellect or the ideal uh, until the mid-19th uh, uh, century. The modern idea of aesthetics in that, pan, in that sense as a branch of philosophy in contempor is contemporary with the age of industrialization. Aesthetics in the modern sense is itself, therefore, an anesthetic. It has removed all bodily sensation and all feeling. Uh, the shock of the war, the shock of the machine, the shock of the uh, metropolis have in common anesthesia, the temporary removal of feeling, whether physical or psychological. Uh, in experience and poverty, the beautiful essay of Walter Benjamin in 1933, he writes about people returning from World War I, poorer in experience, unable to communicate, silent, in shock, after uh, feeling the full force of modern uh, technology. Feeling uh, was no longer possible. Humans were anesthetized. This poverty of experience finds its parallel in uh, Benjamin's uh, view in modern architecture, in glass and steel buildings, in whose uh, smooth surfaces the inhabitant cannot leave any traces, any memory. In his writings on Baudelaire, Benjamin speaks about the smile of passersby in the metropolis, the keep smiling that protects them precisely from an unprecedented number of close encounters with strangers by developing this mimetic strategy. Yeah? So you smile to protect yourself from this avalanche of new faces. So for the first time in, in, uh, in history, you find yourself surrounded uh, and in close proximity with public transportation, uh, etc. to people you've never uh, uh, seen before and you will never see uh, again. So the, the smile actually functions um, as a mimetic uh, uh, shock absorber. Shock absorber, the same words that Benjamin used are the same words that Gims uh, will use to describe their own uh, So the smile is a shock absorber. Modern design is likewise a shock absorber. It's frozen smile, very hides the terror it tries to cover over. And finally, let me read a little bit more from the section of the design of health, because design actually is medicine. Its classical uh, theories of the Greek poly polis follow the theories of the four uh, humors. Contemporary, contemporary ideas of health organize design theories uh, today. Vitruvius in the first uh, century, uh, for example, launched Western architectural theory by insisting that all architects needed to study medicine. So not only you have to study architecture, you have to study medicine uh, first, because health was the, your chief uh, object. He devoted a large part of the first of the uh, ten books of architecture to the question of health. Architecture itself, you can say, uh, was seen as a branch of uh, uh, medicine. As we move uh, uh, down, uh, uh, as Renaissance uh, uh, schools of medic medicine uh, use cast of body parts, designs of schools uh, 
such as the Academy del Diseño in Flor, use cast of historical buildings for teaching, and actually anatomical dissection was a central uh, part of the training. You were supposed to be, as a design student, uh, participate uh, and draw uh, the courses that were decaying in front of you, including the, uh, even reports of people getting seriously ill uh, as the body was uh, decomposing. So the designer, the architect needed to know a lot about anatomy and uh, design uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, draw in doing these uh, dissections. In the sketchbooks of uh, Leonardo uh, uh, da Vinci, architectural interiors even appear next to uh, or besides anatomical drawings. He understood the interior of the brain and of the womb in architectural terms as enclosures that must be cut through to reveal uh, their secrets. Again, moving uh, historically, it doesn't get uh, any <laughs> any better. <laughs> in the mid uh, 19th century, Violet Le Duc, for example, illustrated his uh, famous uh, Dictionnaire Raisonné uh, with perspectival cutaway uh, views of medieval buildings as if had been of the buildings had been dissected. He was influenced, of course, by Georges uh, Cuvier and his lessons of uh, uh, anatomy compare. As medical representations changed, so did architectural representations. In the 20th century, it was precisely the widespread use of X-rays that made a new way of thinking about architecture and design uh, possible. Modern buildings even start to look uh, like uh, like medical images, like X-ray with transparent glass walls revealing the inner secrets of uh, buildings. I don't know how long it took all of this uh, to come out, but it's clearly not only obvious in the architecture, but also um, uh, architects like Adolf Loh, like uh, like uh, Mies or Le Corbusier were themselves collecting uh, X-rays. They were fascinated with the X-ray and the vision that made it possible. And very soon, you start looking at buildings that actually look like they have been seen uh, through uh, an X-ray machine. Every age, of course, has its own affliction, as uh, uh, Han Chulhan writes in the Burnout Society. And we can note that each affliction has its architecture. The age of bacterial uh, diseases, particularly uh, tuberculosis, gave birth to modern architecture, to white buildings detached from the humid ground where the seas breeds, as Le Corbusier uh, put it. Smooth surfaces, big windows and terraces to facilitate taking the sun and the fresh air uh, a cure that was advocated also in sanatoria. The discovery of antibiotics and particularly of streptomycin in the uh, 1940s put an end to that era, but it didn't uh, uh, die so quickly. Here you have, for example, Revista Nacional de Arquitectura of Madrid, June 1952. Still the modernity of the building uh, and the X-ray of the lungs uh, in the same uh, uh, page. Here are some kids. Of course, in, in countries where they don't have enough sunlight, they have all these artificial ways of getting you the um, the uh, uh, the therapy. Anyway, the discovery of antibiotics put uh, an end to that era, and in the post-war year, attention started to be shifted to psychological uh, problem. Problem, and the same architects, the same architects that had been arguing for so long. Uh, about the need to prevent tuberculosis with their architecture, suddenly uh, they see the doctor, uh, the architect not as a doctor, but as a sink, as a psycho psychoanalyst, and the house not just as a medical device for the prevention of disease, uh, but uh, for providing uh, a psychological uh, comfort, what Neutra himself calls nervous uh, health. The 21st uh, century, according to Han, is the century of the uh, neurological disorders, depression, ADHD, uh, borderline disorders, burnout syndrome, etc. So the question for us uh, doing this book is what is the architecture of these new kinds of affliction, uh, afflictions? What does it mean uh, uh, for the sign? Also, uh, we thought about how the 20th century, 21st century also seems to be the, uh, the age of allergies. This is not something that, Ban, uh, that, that Han talks about. The age, if you want, of the environmentally uh, hyper-sensitive, uh, unable to live in the modern world. 
never at any one time in history had been there are so many people that are allergic to everything, allergic to chemicals, buildings, electromagnetic field, fragrances. Since the environment is now almost completely man-made, we have become in a way allergic to ourselves, to our own hyper-extended uh, body in a kind of autoimmune uh, uh, disorder. They are now, I don't know here, but they are now in the United States communities of the afflicted, living in a kind of replay of the 1960s, in bubbles, tents, and all cars that have been cleaned out of all toxic materials, usually in the deserts or far away from civilization. Nomads moving at the very sniff of a chemical coming from a shifting wind that bring wisps of industry, detergent, fabric softener, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, exhaust from cars. As Dodi Bellamy puts it in when the sick rule the world, they are the dropouts of our age. On the other side of the spectrum, there is the burnout society that Han writes about. Those who, in working for themselves, push themselves harder than anybody could have pushed themselves. Them. The achievement subject, who turns out to be much more disciplined than the obedient subject, despite the fact that he obeys only himself. So master and slave are now uh, conflated. The hyper uh, environmental hypersensitive are not mentioned by him, perhaps because he considers them, as many in the medical establishment, as afflicted by a neurological disorder, uh, depressed or hypochondriac. The seemingly opposite symptoms might be two sides of the same coin. Indeed, in all of this, a different kind of uh, uh, idea of city and a new question for design and for architecture, or perhaps a very ancient question about the limits of the body and mind, and how to take shelter in a threatening uh, world today. Okay, so so just to summarize, um, we think that the, that the concept of design, which has gone viral and is used everywhere all the time, in fact, every ch child is, is encouraged to be the designer of their own life. In other words, design is the, is the, the number one model for the human subject. That concept of design, which is, is completely viral, which allows you, for example, to design your children, this is not science fiction, it's uh, current practice, uh, this concept of design was invented more or less in England in the middle of the 19th century in the face of industrialization, the concept of good design. It was then perfected in Germany, uh, in Bauhaus, and then exported, and, and then makes its way into politics, into genetics, into every other field. So we feel that this concept of design, this concept of good design, is not good, and that we have to go back and try to reinvent the concept of design in the face of the radical reality that we live in today, in the same way that we were able to invent a concept in the middle of the 19th century, we need a new concept. So we start a huge research program to rethink design, and this little yellow book is like the tip of that iceberg. But something Beatrice said before is extremely important. We hate Biennales. We especially hate design biennales. Mm -hmm. uh, we were invited to curate a design biennale. Since we hate ourselves, that's normal. We could we could do it, uh, but we had to take apart every aspect of the biennale. And one of the great conspiracies of the biennale is two years, because two years means that you show only things that are slightly new but not too new, right? So there are ways of actually synchronizing, have everybody agree on the same thing. So it was crucial for us to break this two-year thing. And the way we decided to do it was to partner with Eflux, especially with, with uh, Anton Bidokler and uh, Nicholas Hirsch and Nick Axel, to create a superhumanity project which would refuses to accept uh, the two-year uh, limit of a Biennale. And th this is why the Yellow Project gets bigger and bigger, and they can present now. Uh, you are now the victims of uh, Nick and Nick. Thank you, Mark, and uh, it's, it's actually a great pleasure to uh, present this book called Superhumanity, Design of the Self, uh, for the first time here in Madrid before it actually launches in New York or Berlin, uh, so this is uh, really new. Um, the, as Mark just said, the, the project Superhumanity is uh, part of the design biennale to some extent, but uh, it also has a certain autonomy to it, which I think was part of your conspiracy probably um, to work with the biennale, but to also work against it, because the 
what we see now is a book is uh, actually happened as an online project on Leaflux, and it somehow also worked against the the timing of a biennale. Uh, a biennale is an exhibition. It takes usually two months or three months of a uh, lifespan. But the, this online project, uh, Superhumanity, that involved 50 different authors, started uh, around six weeks before the Biennale and also uh, reached longer than the Biennale uh, until January, February uh, last year, which I think started something incredible. Uh, uh, somehow a project that cannot be stopped or actually it's evolving. Let's be a bit more modest. Um, because we had other events, superhumanity events that after, after Istanbul, after collecting different voices on the occasion of the Istanbul Biennale, we had an event in Seoul. Uh, we will publish actually these, um, contributions for the Seoul event this week. Uh, in parallel to the Madrid uh, Design Week. Uh, there was an event in Havana, and um, there will be the event tomorrow in Madrid. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting concept that can evolve, which is somehow also the possibility of, of the Internet and of the, what it can perform. And um, it, it somehow started with a discussion based on the question of a human raised by Beatrice and Mark, um, and somehow linked this to a text uh, by and thoughts by Boris Groys, uh, which I will just read some some uh, sentences. Our culture is commonly described as being narcissistic, and narcissism is understood as a total concentration on oneself, as a lack of interest in society. However, it's difficult to say that the methodological narcissus is interested exclusively in himself. Obviously, he's not interested in satisfying his desires, which he aesthetically rejects. But neither is he interested in an inner subjective vision accessible exclusively to his own contemplation, isolating him from others. Rather, he's enchanted by the reflection of his body in the lake, presenting itself as an objective, profane image produced by nature and potentially accessible to everyone. So the, as uh, Boris Groys writes, the contemporary narcissus, however, cannot be so certain of his own taste. Today, we are unable to like ourselves if we are not liked by the society in which we live. And in our society, we have to become active if we want to be sub the, the objects of others' admiration. Contemporary subjects cannot only rely on the looks they were born with. They must practice self-design and produce their own image with the goal of becoming liked by society, which I think um, is pretty much what we will be discussing tomorrow, social media. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll stop here in, in order to, um, it's, we don't want to continue a kind of academic presentation, but we also want to ping pong uh, arguments and uh, um, a number of topics that have been addressed by the authors we invited, um, but uh, we just thought it's important to relate um, the question of superhumanity, design of the self, to Boris Groys here, yeah. um, because it's what seems to be new in today, in this moment of history, is this: is that probably individuals feel more than ever this pressure coming from the large scale, from society, from from uh, social media, for instance, to perform. So it's, it's, I think everything that is designed around us that maybe in other centuries was rather abstract force somehow became much closer to us. 
and not only through tools like Facebook and others and uh, or telecommunication we should forget we are at Telefonica here yeah? so it seems to be the right spot uh, but we are now already living in a in a world where we can design children where uh, implantation of uh, intelligent tools will be the future and and I think this is where the individual is somehow asked to take position. I think this is Boris Groys's plea uh, that, like, from being uh, just a witness or a victim of that uh, approach of design, um, it's very important to to somehow find a critical approach. Although, well, what is critique here? I think we also have to reinvent the models of critique um, to because to be outside of that system seems to be to be more and more impossible and yeah Nick maybe you want to yeah, address yeah sure I mean the, you know this 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 concept of self-design I mean we're, we've never been surrounded so much by ourselves um, in terms of you know minutes hours uh, megabytes um, you know words sounds etc um, and you know Groys really gives us quite a quite a quite an interesting um, perspective onto this. He he traces it genealogically back to um, the the secularization of the West, um, and he he sees in in what he originally called the 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 obligation to self design and this this concept that we that we are kind of um, uh, taking and running with and, 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 you know, perverting and spoiling in various ways. Um, it's something that he's been working on for, for a number of years. Um, but in, when, when he first brought this, uh, when he first developed this concept, um, he, he traced the, what he called the obligation or the imperative to design oneself as the secular Jason that Christianity put on its subjects to design their soul and to purify their soul. Um, and so I think, you know, now, now that, uh, if, if we are to take his thesis that this has become a question of the self, um, and if we look to this question of are we human to, to see all of these accoutrements, all of these, uh, all of these, you know, prostheses or, or paraphernalia that, that give us our own sense of self, um, I, I think, you know, I, it's, it's important to understand that, that this, that the way that we understand self and the way that it's become operative within within our culture today um, is is historically contingent in multiple ways, and I think that this is this is one of the things that I think each of our each of these essays they they try and take um, kind of individual moments where where one particular way of um, of understanding the relationship between self and other understanding the relationship between. Um, between human and non-human, um, understanding the, the the relationship between between visual um, and and non-visual, uh, th there there are various moments and instances um, that were that we're not necessarily trying to say are uh, are wrong, um, but I think we're 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 trying to um, say if if this is let's say potentially where we where we are, um, you know how can we how can we move forward from here or how can we kind of create new histories for you know new new let's say bad designs for for the self um, and so I think because you know we, we don't want to spend too much time and we, we also have a have a contributor here Ingo to uh, to present some work that he's been doing I just want to want to do a, a really quick run through with the book I mean you, you can kind of see the size here it's quite a hefty book um, as, uh, as Nicholas mentioned we, we originally commissioned 50 essays um, that were all published online this is the way that it looks in the book um, and um, so as as uh, as as Nicholas mentioned, we we started with because uh, really the concept of the project departed from self design. So you know, looking more at, at, at understandings of of one's own position in the world rather than the the question of the species itself. Um, so uh, we we moved on, and here I'm just presenting you know some some glimpses of 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 what is inside the book, um, and also to understand try to try and give you an idea of the breadth of the topics that are that are covered. Because you know we out of these 50 people that that we invited, um, there were architects, there were artists, there were designers, there were philosophers, there were anthropologists, there were historians, there were there were uh, geneticists, there were there were there were numerous types of uh, people and different approaches to this question. So we're we're not in, in this trying to to narrow down an understanding of what the self is and what it means to design it, but really trying to open it and almost, you know, lay it in front of you as a field for your own interventions. 
Um, so, and Andrew Hersher, for example, looked at um, looked at uh, humanitarian design and and uh, the ethics, particularly behind uh, Shigeru Ban's interventions um, in refugee crises in Rwanda um, and and in the Philippines, um, and the understanding how how uh, you know how goodness is is literally embodied in in, in pieces of paper um, and deployed and then of course collected by museums and uh, and, and internationalized um, this contribution by Lydia Calpoliti, uh was looking at, uh, at at the moment where um, the the US military was uh, first experimenting um, with with creating uh, Creating augmentations for uh, for for the body for the human to 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 give it this kind of mechatronic or or uh, this mech world that that we now see today. Um, she traces this history uh, back to uh, back to the 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 fifties and the sixties um, through a number of patents and a number of rather experimental and quite radical design studios. I would say within the U.S. government. Um, Rax Media Collective uh, has a contribution looking at a at a very enigmatic exchange between uh, Isamu Noguchi and Buckminster Fuller, um, trying to 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 understand the equation. Um, in the sense, uh, well, I'll, I'll in 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 with respect to them, I will not spoil what that equation is. Um, for you, um, Felicity Scott looked at uh, looked at the um, explorations in uh, in of NASA um, and and space design, but particularly looking at the way that um, this question of putting the human in space completely reconfigured our own uh, and let's say decentered our own understanding of the human and, and what it can take and what and what it uh, you know can be subject to. So uh, particularly departing from this uh, this post Vitruvian man diagram. Um, so Ingo Nierman, who's who will be speaking later, uh, spoke about um, the you know real estate and and the and the you know the 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 stakes of of contributing to an exploding market in in Berlin through a uh, through a potentially autobiographical, potentially fictional, we're not entirely sure account. Um, and uh, Spiros Papapetros looks at, uh, at at the work of, of Frederick Kiesler, um, who tries to to create an origin of design and and tries to locate it through the transformation of material and and the birth of abstraction and the birth of ornament. Um, Julianne Rebentisch, and uh, like I said, there's uh, so this this might seem a lot, but this is um, it's 400 pages of of quite solid content. Um, so this is this is really only a fraction. Um, so is satisfaction in democratic culture looking at the way that the media contributes um, to our understandings of politics and political debate? Um, and uh, Francesca Hughes looking at kind of the the origins of uh, of CAD software, um, and but tracing it back to the early studies of of Alberti um, in the way to understand perspective and the way to correct irregularities in in uh, in geometric drawings. Um, and then, lastly, uh, a contribution just from this uh, from the section of Liam Young on uh, on uh, that that was a part of a one of his performances and videos into uh, in working with drones and seeing through the eyes of a drone. Um, so, as as was mentioned, uh, the 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 Superhumanity Project is quite sprawling, um, and we're we're really happy that will that it will land and has landed now officially in uh, in Madrid. Um, so this is a uh, this is a uh, the exhibition of it as part of the Istanbul Design Biennial um, is designed as a field of agitprop kiosks by Andres Hake and the, his Office for Political Innovation. Um, likewise, we at, at the opening we held a conference um, with a number of speakers, um, and as as was mentioned, uh, we, we've we've had stops in Havana, in Seoul, uh, which is this conference here, um, and. Uh, and Princeton as well, um, and so yeah, we are we are super happy to to have you all take part in this uh, in this growing sprawling network of superhumans. Um, and so, but before before I invite Ingo up to uh, to to present some some recent work he's been doing on uh, I believe the the Army of Love his project. Um, I just want to mention that after this, uh, we will be selling copies of of both books um, at a, at a reduced rate at the table out front. Um, so thank you all very much, and I really hope uh, you'll all join tomorrow. So thanks, and okay. Ingo. Ingo. Hey, you need the computer? Ah, you're not uh, hooked up. Here's a mic. Um,
Okay. Do you need the computer, or are you okay just to speak? I can just speak. Okay. I think yeah, Ingo, it's uh, such a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I think we, we haven't met over two years, three years, too long. So uh, thank you for Design Week to make this possible, this reunion. And um, I think within the logics also of this evolving superhumanity project, uh, we thought uh, maybe it's more interesting to hear uh, something we don't know much about, this Army of Glass project, rather than uh, doing kind of classic reading of the text that you contributed to the to the book here, which uh, we hope you will all read, of course. Um, it's actually uh, very related. And if you know about the Army of Love and then read the text, you, I mean, you would sense that I'm actually, I mean, it's, it's just a very, it's just a step. Uh, I think it's already in there, in, the, in that, in that book, because, uh, in that text, because the title is Real Estate Porn. Um, it says it all. It's like our libido is completely, um, sucked in by, by real estate. Um, <clears throat> our obsession with real estate, um, and uh, yeah, I, I I found really interesting what what uh, Beatrice was saying because it's it's a long history. This kind of uh, yeah, libidinous obsession with architecture, and uh, at the same time, and and this is why I I really like this term, um, an aesthetic. Um, it's really about uh, dumbing ourselves and um, in in uh, I think it's 1981 um, a, a brand forecast uh, what do you say trend forecaster uh, face popcorn came up with the term cocooning it's not that she really described something new but she saw that there is something moving people are more and more, she said, before people would rather go for a red sports car, now they go for a red couch. That was like her, her <laughs> observation. And, uh, and she described it as, you know, our, our society. It was, um, after the, like, really, really turbulent 1970s, uh, uh, economic turbulences as well. There was again a new fear of the nuclear war, um, and then I mean she she really worked. I mean she worked on this term through the whole 80s, and everything seemed to uh, yeah come in hands. And there was Chernobyl. Okay, yeah, there was the AIDS crisis, and so I mean everything was meant uh, crime, uh, the the fear of inner city inner city life. So cocooning is is the answer to this. Um, and uh, and you m must be aware this was long. There was no social media yet. You know, I mean, we were still. Uh, this was really uh, very pre-digital. She even came up with this term cocooning before the home computer uh, kind of came into place. I think it was a bit later, no? but at least still it got really popular. Uh, um, <clears throat> I don't. I, I I don't know. My first home computer. I, I, I think it was 1984 I got one, but yeah, maybe it, the term existed already. Um, <clears throat> but you could, uh, um, <clears throat> and of course it is very, it was very propelled by capitalism. I mean, the, the, uh, this is my argument in, in, in the text here that it has a lot to do with that space is limited. And um, <clears throat> I mean, real space, not virtual space, that's a different. The virtual space is unlimited and real space is limited, which makes it uh, so interesting to speculate on it. We know that we experience the same with bitcoins. Why was bitcoin so great to speculate with? Because they're pre limited. You know already how many uh, bitcoins will be exist maximum and uh, that makes it very attractive for speculation. Um, uh, um, so, but I think, I mean, the, the general understanding of cocooning was always, yeah, it's to, to shelter, protect yourself from the outside. But I think the main, the main motivation is actually to protect yourself from, from your inside and from, uh, um, yeah, and, uh, from a kind of, um, 
a, a strong strong feelings uh, from and for instance from from love and you see this in in films where where you have all this like um, when people go to their homes when you see actually like in Hollywood people people see at their homes um, I did later on I did another uh, research where I looked how long it took till actually uh, women were shown at their homes, uh, at their own homes and so on. But now you see them pretty often and you see them, there's always this scene uh, where, where a woman is holding a cup with two hands, you know, uh, and often she has the sleeves like, uh, like very much over her hands and then she's holding this cup and she's around it by, by pillows. Uh, and, <clears throat> and this is usually a scene where, where you, where you seek shelter from uh, emotional turbulences in your own home actually and uh, in, in these films is very often love um, and so I think th so this this uh, for me it's very apparent I, I don't know if I mention it in this text but uh, I mean the, the the title real estate pond says it uh, that that love um, <clears throat> you know and this I'm, I'm talking now really about sensual love that um, for instance the the rates of sexual intercourse in our society are going down and down. Yeah, they're, they're really spiraling down. And at the same time, we have this obsession with real estate. So, um, <laughs> uh, and now uh, coming to, to, uh, to this question of design, and this is uh, uh, the army of love, is, is, is a design concept. Um, uh, that is, uh, how could we kind of rediscover love and um, uh, really uh, go, go into it and uh, at the same time wouldn't have to be that, afra that afraid of it. Yeah, is it, is it possible to, to, lo to love, to love deeply and um, without, without these like dangerous uh, uh, side effects of, of uh, being lovesick, you know, it's uh, lovesick is, is is like a horrible state. It's like like drug withdrawal, uh, only that it can last much much longer. So it's uh, <clears throat> it's it's a really horrible condition. Um, and um, yeah, or how can we so uh, you know uh, and encourage encounter again, uh, sensual encounter again, and uh, this is this is the, the concept of the army of love, which didn't start i when i got this idea it didn't start with with real estate but with this observation that um, we 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 are very aware in our society of inequalities um but usually uh, we we only think of material inequalities and uh, other in inequalities are more of a taboo or we we kind of want to talk them away uh, so we have uh, body positivity, which is a way of, okay, the society stigmatizes my body, so I just, I'm just body positive and somehow, you know, I, I, I overcome this problem. And of course, I would love others to, to then love my body as well because I love my body. Um, but this is not necessarily the case. Um, and, um, <clears throat> Uh, ageism, we, uh, our society, uh, uh, yeah, stigmatize at least uh, when it comes to physical attraction, it, it stigmatizes age. So we try to counter it with uh, with calling it ageism and and create kind of taboos of what we talk about. But this does not mean that uh, uh, again, it's this kind of uh, building protections. But it doesn't mean that this goes away and that. Uh, um, people just by uh, that we don't talk about um, don't won't feel discriminated anymore, um, or not just don't feel discriminated, uh, not that they're simply discriminated. Um, uh, it, uh, so so there's all sorts of major irritations with love. You can feel not loved enough, or you can feel uh, as well. You can be exposed to too much love. Can as well be a big problem. Um, so, so the army of love is the the, the approach is, um, and it's not. It's a potential organization, and we it's a kind of organization in the making since two years. Uh, but we don't. It's the question: Can we? Uh, our basic question is: Can we redistribute love? 
um, can can we give more to those who have don't have enough? Can we can those uh, yeah uh, can those who who get too much can 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 a bit be taken away from them? Um, and so this is a series of we started with a promotion video, then we did. Uh, uh, many workshops in the last two years. Sometimes it's just a day, sometimes a whole week, uh, where we explore this and both uh, physically um, with all kinds of exercises and with conversations where we try to discuss all sorts of problems we could encounter with such a concept. Yeah. <coughs> Can you explain what the physical exercises were? Sorry. Yeah, do you want to show some, some of the Yeah. yeah. I can yeah. show. Let um, me see if I can. Maybe when, where we talk. Let's do a quote. Can we. It's on Google. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why do you look for it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you lost your mic. Yeah. Oh. I just explained it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not operational. It is. Yeah. Yeah. You can hear. Okay. So, so just to explain, I mean, when a when a book comes out with a lot of writers, like in this case, we have fifty writers. There is a kind of arrogance of this, right? A kind of like super survey on a super big subject like superhumanity. And we thought it would be interesting for you to listen to one of the people who writes for the book, just so that you understand for each of the 50 writers, more or less this is their life's work. I mean, they're really thinking a lot about this question, uh, are we human? So it was very important for Beatrice and I and then for, mm -hmm. for Nick and Nick to, to allow you just to listen, to hear that, that for each person, this is basically their life, and you, and and uh, we, we we go we intrude a little bit into your into your life uh, to show this. So this is one of the one of the experiments, no? Uh, yeah, this is this is a promotional video we started with. Um, I actually before I'd I'd written a novel about this whole question of uh, is redistribution law possible? Can can we get a more complete understanding of justice than just uh, material justice? Uh, so that's uh, this novel is called Complete Love. Um, and uh, when I was about to finish it, I I yeah I got invited by Berlin Biennial to contribute and. Uh, they knew that I was writing on this novel, and then there was the question of could do something based on it, um, and and then in the beginning we sort of doing something really in 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 the in the public, but it turned out to yeah we we really thought of an efficient way and came up with this idea of a promotion video, which is forty minutes in the beginning we thought it would be only five minutes and what it has it has all these people you see there floating and and carrying in the water the people and doing other exercises and um <clears throat> Uh, we, we made an open call to just distribute it with email for fans and so on and uh, describe the basic concept of the Army of Love. Later on you will have more subtitles. Now now someone is speaking. In, no, I think here there should be subtitles. Um, <coughs> um, uh, and, and people who could imagine to be part of this Army of Love. So it's like a semi-documentary. Uh, and what the people then talk about in this film, like um, in the voiceover, is uh, their, their perception of love, uh, their understanding as love, and as well about their potential role in the army of love. And as you can see, it's a very diverse group of people. Like here, there's Matthias Vernaldi, a sex activist with muscular dystrophy, and um, who would see himself not uh, not like a client of the army of love, but really as someone who can give love. He is very good. He has really enormous conversation skills. Uh, I know, and he's very, he's super charming. And, uh, uh, yeah, so we have a blind person as well. Uh, uh yeah, all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. 
So we we would, I guess, like to have a conversation with the, the audience. Now. Yeah. So, where's the first uh, question? Well, maybe maybe I can uh, I can ask and go a question in in the meantime. Um, when when you speak about redistribution of love, I mean, I kind of I I, I love this idea, but because I'm almost imagining this task force, you know, is, is like employing guerrilla tactics, almost, you know, where it goes in and it kind of um, it, it gives, you know, it, it it deploys, you know, various maneuvers and various tactics. And so I wonder, I mean, how do you have have you have you kind of developed a uh, like a playbook or um, or how, how do you go about actually, um, kind of building this, this, uh, this task of redistribution? Um, uh, yeah, in the meantime, we produce the manual for mm -hmm. prospective members of the Army of Love. Um, um, <clears throat> I, I, yeah, I could have shown it to you as well. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, really this idea, how you prepare yourself as well, like mentally, yeah, really how you design yourself to become a, a soldier of the army of love, uh, how to interact with people, how to be not, you know, you have to be careful, you shouldn't be too paternalistic. I mean, someone can be as per completely fine, you're, you're lovesick, that doesn't mean that someone has to come and, and try to, to, you know, maybe, you enjoy being lovesick or it's something where you think you have to go through. You don't want to have some mm. other love put on top, you know? So, so you have to be very, you cannot be, I think you cannot be too offensive. That would not be good. That's not the idea. It's not this flower power idea of love. This is, so the whole concept of the army love is, is, is very against free love. Free love was this idea that you just have to flood the world with love. And then at some point, it's very much like um, new, uh, like Reaganomics or, or this like triple down effect. You just have to flood the world. I mean, you just have to, some people are super rich and they get richer and richer. They have more and more money, and then some money will triple down. And this is was the kind the, of flower power. The comes. invisible hand yeah, of and, love. And you come and you spread, you spend your money, and so on. And everyone will have a bit. Yeah, and uh, I think this concept is not 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 uh, not very convincing in in several aspects. Um, uh, it's it as we know it it just increases in inequality, and at the same time, yes, it makes people completely. Uh, you know, you t I, I think when people you have these like free hug people and they offer you a hug, I already find this too offensive. So the army of love in this sense, yes, guerrilla tech is much more subtle, mm -hmm. with much more, much, uh, you know, it cannot be, yeah, hey, I, I hug you and then, then be happy and, and already with as well this enforcement. I give you love and then, yeah, then show me, show me that you get happy. It can be so aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, the army of love has to come with an enormous amount of patience, both even to the point when, when to interact with people and then, you might need a lot, a lot of patience. It's you cannot just come and give a bit of love and then go to the next one. Yeah, that's not how it works. But it's, I think there's something really striking in in somehow combining love and and the notion of redistribution yeah? because redistribution comes or hints more to to a sphere of. And we know it from planification, yeah, like state planning. So we, as I think there are four architects here who all know or seem to know uh, what planning is. So it's like planning love. Yeah, but I think planning is not, not a bad thing. Not, not at all. And our society is anyhow completely planned. Hmm. Uh, and there is this idea that love is this spontaneous sphere that is that is kind of this counter world to the planned world and it's just not true it's really really not true we completely plan our love and our love for instance is completely depending on the concept of mutuality so uh, if you would if you continue to love someone who doesn't love you back and you show this love and so on i mean you're you're considered to be uh, mentally at least have a problem you know uh, to, to, to speak politely. Um, uh, 
And uh, it's something, I mean, for, and it's not that I want to criticize this. I mean, the uh, stalking is, is a big problem and really can be experienced as a threat. But this means our concept of love is not at all. You know, you always are aware, you always have to be, it's a, this idea of a constant exchange of you, uh, how much love I give, how much I give back, and then uh, how much attraction I give, and when uh, you know, when one person is more t considered to be, on, by the general perception, is more attractive, it doesn't even have to be, be between the partners, then immediately there's an idea of, of inequality and uh, that has to be compensated or people will look for the compensation. Ah, this person is more attractive, so means the other person is giving more of this and this, giving more money, giving more experience and so on. So our idea uh, is is really a very very planned concept, and not not to not to talk of of marriage, yeah, or polyamory as well. It's an extremely planned concept. You know, it 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 goes with a lot of organization. You know, uh, you, you, I think it's something you, uh, uh, yeah, impossible probably without modern digital communication. No? But I'm I'm I'm. Now getting kind of some weird connections with with where the are we human book starts with this idea of ornament, um, right? Because I mean, you 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 just raised the the relationship between beauty and love, um, and this idea of attraction. Um, and so I wonder if 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 this army of love almost isn't taking ornament in, in crime or, or almost is is almost not a Lucian project um, to 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 kind of move beyond um, the the question of of aesthetics or or how how does how does how do you engage with this question of ornament and this question of beauty? Ornament. Hmm. Yeah. Or I mean, you 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 were speaking about you know that. Uh, um, ornament. Yeah. Um, you mean not arms, but you mean ornaments. Ornaments, like a. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm maybe falsely or, or naively conflating it with the question of, of beauty, um, but as these 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 things that are given, let's say, aesthetic value that that make one attracted to to the object that possesses them. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, and and this is you know uh, and uh, this really comes to this are we human? Uh, I, I think this title was the question mark, which I see as a question mark uh, uh, for me is a question mark uh, to humanism. Uh, and humanism has this is kind of forced to assume that, for instance, every every person is beautiful. Yeah, yeah? at least I mean it's the inner beauty, it's the inner beauty that counts, and somehow everyone is in. It has some inner beauty, and even if this person is behaving in, a, in ways that you can only explain as evil, still there is an inner beauty somewhere, it's just somewhere hidden, and so on and so on. There is this, uh, um, we, are, we are forced <coughs> to, to, to assume that the ideas which were then, as at the same time we, no, we do not really believe in it, uh, lead us to um, problematizing beauty in general. Just even the concept, or kind of that's an, that's then the other way of just you know shying away of of the concept of beauty at all, and I think this is highly problematic because then by not by kind of having this taboo, uh, we actually end up in in uh, uh, not reflecting it, not quest, not really questioning it, uh, and then you you see that our society has beauty ideals that that are so for me so close to fascism yeah i mean ju just of course there's exceptions and so on we know this and they are celebrated for being exceptions but but on average it's 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 completely fascism and i don't think that this is because it's our biology i don't believe this at all and then coming back to 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 the very first images you were showing and with the with the feet and the shoes and so on it's you know and we have we have so many potential to overcome ourselves and i don't i don't believe uh, in this at all okay, uh, can i still ah uh, you can oh. i mean the i mean the little yellow book okay it's a kind of uh, history of design or history of the concept of design from 200,000 years ago to the last two seconds. So it, this is the kind of, let's say, ambition of the book. And it's about sex from beginning to end, like every phase, sex. Mm. But I think the word love never appears. Mm. 
so and and I'm interested maybe the images here the movie it's hard it, it's easy to see it in sex terms and also easy to see it in love terms but there is a kind of vibration between love and sex at least I would like to ask the question and I ask it as somebody ignorant about uh, sex and especially ignorant about love <laughs> but I present you a, a possible theory I think the ignorance is uh, of course a personal problem but also uh, let's say a more general problem when I say I love something it's because or someone or some place or some country mm. or some come on uh, I say it and I use this word exactly because I don't know the right words to use uh, I use the word love to explain that without this thing I am not happy but I can't explain so so the word love for me is is completely tied up with with uh, not being able to explain right and for me the idea that you cannot explain something and that it is designed they are not these can two thoughts can go together so when you said for example that love is very much planned for me, this is not in contradiction with the idea that mm. love is also somehow exceeds the ability to mm. design. We, we are used to the idea that planning is is projecting the future in a kind of imperialist manner. You have a structure for the future. You impose the present on the future, but planning is also possibly engagement with the unknown, like it's creating a framework for for the unknown. So I kind of wanted to go back to your to your question about love because if I make a kind of conservative reading of your argument, love is uh, unevenly distributed, and you have a distribution project to uh, re redistribute it. Uh, but that that does imply that it's a kind of a thing, like a, like a, mm. uh, like wealth uh, or capital. It, it it is it is a sort of a substance of some kind, and the idea that it's a kind of a substance. Or a fluid, or a liquid, or an atmosphere, or a value, is a little bit different from the idea of love as a kind of uh, uh, l lack of understanding, or la lack, of, like a kind of a gap. So I, I kind of want to ask a little bit more, and I ask it because every time you say something about love, uh, I find myself agreeing with you. Like I feel like you have become something like an expert uh, about love, which for me means an expert in. Firstly, the thing I don't understand, but the thing I think we never understand. Like, it's the word we use for that reason. Is that because I just have this romantic idea about love, you know, um, and you you don't? <laughs> like, you have, as well, after me, you have to say something as well. I cannot <laughs> see the, uh, the corners. Um, um, okay, if you, if you get me in a, like, really... Um, um, self, self-conscious moment. I would say, of course, I'm an expert in love because I'm a, uh, for a very simple reason because I'm a novelist. You know, this is what what I'm foremost am. And as I said, the whole idea, even though the term doesn't appear, it comes from a novel, novel. Uh, and and our ideas of love are completely. I mean, they come from literature. Uh, isn't that? I mean, who came up with this? You know. Uh, and I thought again of it when you said in the beginning, you said, you know, we believe in books. Yeah. And I thought, come on, what is this? This is, uh, this is like we believe in God. This is already the decline when you have to make a claim. Oh, I believe, I believe in the book. We have to be, you have to be afraid of the book. You have to, just as you have to fear God, you have to fear the book. And the romantic novel was something that was really feared by the people, you know, because it could, you know, it implanted this conception of the romantic love into into people, and there was this whole idea that you know you give women. Uh, there was especially this idea, of course, very misogynic conception. You give if you give women these books, and then you know implant these ideas of romantic love in them, and then then they are spoiled, you know, and they are not uh, proper marriage material anymore. Uh, so yes, yes. Um, and and when you when it comes to to planning, of course, it's this idea. It's always dialectics. Now you have planning, so makes you move, uh, push forward. And then there is this moment of spontaneity. And uh, and I think again, this is something we discuss a lot. And uh, like when you ask about steps, the new step we are working on is called code. 
our code, a code of ethics. And again, this sounds very stiff, but it's all about avoiding, actually avoiding to to create this uh, this illusion that the army of love can create something that is completely safe. And we have now these terms like safe space, for instance. And you know, this you can never have this this complete safety. And there you would be again with this concept of cocooning of of uh, you know of building walls of, of you, then then you have to isolate yourself. Um, but but you have been dealing with with love and architecture a lot. I mean this is where I started to know your work and this is like this super famous essay uh, about Corbusier and how you know how this was cry. completely like uh, and this like revenge jealousy and so on you know. All the complications of love that you are talking about, this incredible obsession, uh, which, uh, strangely enough, all these stories are always clean up of the histories of, uh, not so much in literature, you see, that's the problem with design and, and architecture, that they are made to, to feel that they are, you know, uh, practical things and we don't, me you don't want to mess with all this, uh, or introduce all this messiness of, of, uh, of life, but in fact are impossible to understand outside of this story. So you cannot uh, understand Le Corbusier, in my view, without understanding uh, the obsession with uh, with Aline Gray and the obsession with the Arab woman and the obsession and the jealousy and the, all these emotions that are, you know, you, you talk about the novel, but there is some, also some, something more private uh, there in, in love, before language, before the novel, there is love already, right? And, and it still is in... in um, very much part of that that exceeds language and that exceeds our our understanding of it. In a way, we are co communicating uh, through love in 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 ways uh, that are also relating, I think, to to our most uh, primal uh, fears and and uh, and and uh, we exist in that in in that uh, uh, before we were human, maybe even. No? Okay. Because a lot of communication has nothing to do with uh, uh, knowledge and has all the complexities that you are talking about as well, right? Mm. That's why I like so much your project too, because it's, you know, there are practically no wars here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's not the novel only, it's not the war. Yeah. We should open it up. Yeah. So you must have a question there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. ¿Se oye? Ya. Bueno, no quería eh, preguntar sobre un tema que tiene que ver un poco con. I wanted to ask about the quest this question of condition of human beings. It seems that we are considered human when we are conscious of our own mortality. But at the same time, man has had to invent gods to be conscious of immortality. So now we are living through a moment where the, the possibility of being immortal starts to become possible without the need of having a god because we can be immortal with our bodies in our with our hardware as it were which we focused a little bit to the world of design and we can be immortal with our software also with our metadata everything that we generate we, we produce in our virtual lives so the question is how, what do you think what's going to happen with this possibility of being immortal without the need to invent a god and how can this affect our condition our body our bodily and spiritual condition Okay. Okay. Oh. Right, what well, is a super interesting question? Some different points. Uh, number one, uh, this is such an old question. Uh, we are we are used to thinking of the idea of a kind of superhuman that survives in in, in technology or in software. We, we think of this as a, as a contemporary question, but this is a very strong argument in, in the 19th century already. So, as you know, in, in, in the face of industrialization, 
uh, in the newspapers, not in science fiction and not in uh, philosophy, but in, in the newspapers, is already the fear that uh, human is now the slave of the machine and the machine is some kind of animal and we have to be like a machine to serve. So already is the feeling that the human is gone and that, and that this machine is been made by the human, so we are already making a new human that will be immortal. So and and a, a god uh, already. This is this is the language. We can go back even 15th, 14th century and find the, the same arguments. So even we could suggest that if the human is becomes human with technology, then and this is like point number two. If the human becomes human through technology, that therefore the nothing is more human than technology. Technology is what makes us human. So in a way, what you have asked about already happened. We already made uh, 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 this. So th this is very small piece of good design. It's very compact. It's very smooth. I, sl I sleep with it. It is the first thing I touch in the morning. And it is the last thing I touch in the evening. When I say me, I mean billions of people, everybody. Also, we touch it with, with a, a tenderness that normally is for a lover or a small child. I mean, normally in the morning you touch your phone like this and you touch your lover like this. No? So this is, this is, I don't know if this is love or, or not, but something like this. And, it, and this object tries to be part of my body and, and part of my uh, brain. Mm. But this object on, only works because it's part of the biggest object that the human species has ever made, of which Telefonica is one uh, piece, the, the communication system. Communication system is the biggest object it is the same size of the planet. It's actually bigger than the planet because it's in the satellites. So, do I have the cell phone or does the cell phone have me? Hmm. Uh, so, al already you can say we have created uh, a kind of autonomous uh, life form in, in, the, in this system. And this system is not uh, artificial intelligence. There's nothing artificial about it. It is human intelligence. So, so one possible answer to your question is: is uh, uh, not not only it's possible, not not only is the question very old, but also we we already moved into this uh, uh, phase a, ver a very very long 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 time ago. But when we are in a design school, somehow we forget about that, and and we return to the image of the human as as a. Yeah, n n nobody in, in in design is really really thinking that what what kind of species we have invented. The cuatro punto, <laughs> the fourth point, and seems to me so important. Okay, this this is a basic human or more or less, I mean New Zealand, so it's not so, not not so good. <laughs> but let's say a basic model of a, a human. I am 1% genetically human, only 1%. And inside me are 100,000 uh, bacteria. Without these bacteria, I do not survive. Uh, these bacteria were millions of years older than human and will last millions of years after. Of the 1% that I am genetically human, only 0.01% is different from a dog or a monkey. So you could say that this species is 0.01% human, but it's mainly a collaboration between 100,000 species, and we will not last very long, and uh, 100,000 bacteria will keep surviving. So this idea that we have made a, a new technological god, as you say, uh, not only it has already happened, but the only thing that is interesting in this is what will it mean for the insects? Because the insects are 50% of biological life on this planet and 90% of the biodiversity, and they have lived here for 
long, long time. And are they impressed by the human? No. Do they think that Telefonica is interesting? No. They are everywhere. They are in this building, everywhere. They are in, inside you. So probably the human has been replaced by a kind of techno-human a long time ago. And the real question is, what do the other species uh, think about that? Um, but uh, do, do, we, do we, like simple uh, humans, have very much to offer? I'm not so sure. And this, this is where I would, would like to go back to the presentation because I thought it was so interesting, the idea that the cocoon is not for the outside but, but for the inside. And some people will say what was wrong with uh, humanism is that the inside of the human is pure violence, is pure anger, is pure hatred, is, is something to be feared. Um, and, and, and I think all of those uh, uh, novels about the horror of the inside are, are for that reason very uh, uh, interesting. So this, this uh, technological superhuman that we have already made probably is a better human, probably, than, than uh, the human on the inside. I, I give you just one example. In, in 1959, uh, the Dutch artist Constant Nieuwenhuis imagined a future of no labor uh, because of machines, a future in which uh, we will all be architects, we will all be designers, because we have nothing else to do but to design our own life and our own world and our own body. He says, I cannot draw the human body because we will maybe have a different body and so on. After uh, Vietnam War, he became convinced that if you give freedom to the human, we will kill each other. Uh, that the inside of the human, the desire of the human, is something absolutely uh, frightening. So I think I think it's, I say this only because when we think about the possibility that the human is going to be replaced, well, maybe it's a good idea uh, uh, for the planet. Probably a very good idea that we should leave. No, <laughs> I think that actually. I think that actually that's uh, extremely interesting because as you, uh, you were saying, one of the last drawings of the new Babylon is actually the killing of a sex worker. Like, uh, there is a sex worker that uh, has been killed. So it's not only this kind of happy image, but also like the dark side of love, let's say. And I think that that was very interesting, like uh, what Ingo was saying in that sense, because it's also the shift between uh, at some point even like the 70s and the 80s, between this idea of love, even like, for example, uh, these very famous parties, uh, nightclub, that it was like, love saves the day. It was uh, the title of them. And then actually after the HIV AIDS crisis, it's going to be like, sex kills the day uh, at some point. Um, what I was thinking is that it's actually quite interesting that this kind of cocoon uh, could be a revenge, it's extremely designed, but it's full of violence, and it's actually constructing an arena instead of an agreement. If love could be defined so many times as a kind of an agreement, as a pact between two, three, or so many others, it is not so much, as uh, you were describing at some point, Ingo, but a confrontation, a place of confrontation and an arena or a place for discussion, isn't it? <laughs> So. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I completely just think it's not. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> no. No. I. I said just yes. Yeah. But, but at, it was just um, at, at the same time. It's I of no importance. It. It has nothing to do yeah. with it. Um. I think it's better uh, if someone else wants to say something. Then any more really some. Do we have more questions? Yeah. 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 Maybe we take one or two more and then. Yeah. Okay. So basically, um, I was interested in this idea of uh, technological human, and and I sort of uh, see it as uh, Bunchul Han in the in the swarm talks about the Homo electronicus, and he sort sort of sees it as a very uh, negative and something that we should sort of be aware of in in a mostly negative um, way. So I was, um, I would like to know more on your take on this idea of uh, perhaps 
um, just move uh, behind the the age of the masses to the like age of the digital swarm. Digital. Digital. You can't give me the I, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't know. I, got the, I, 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 I didn't get the my, question. My, my favorite word in the whole universe is electro domestico. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, only in Spain could you have this, this fantastic uh, confusion of domesticity and electricity. And mm -hmm. I don't know if we have an e electronico domestico uh, situation. But I can start the conversation, and I'm sure uh, Beatrice probably can, can continue, because uh, with every technological change, there are always people saying, fantastic, we are finally superhuman, finally. So there's always the cheerleaders, and then there's always a group of people saying, this is the end of the human, the end of everything, it's a disaster. There's never the middle. <laughs> so when, when there's a technological change, there is like, Huge celebration, but usually on the side of, of capital, of new industry, and, and so on. And then hu hu huge uh, 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 resistance. But I like very much Marshall McLuhan's argument. He argues that with each new technology, the human becomes something different. And this change is completely shocking. Uh, it's so shocking. We never can really see our current condition. We, we see our previous condition. So when somebody says the age of the digital homo electronicus is something a bit s scary, whatever they are talking about, it's not as scary as homo electronicus actually is. And, and in a certain way, what McLuhan says is we have to anesthetize ourselves. We have to kind of disconnect ourselves from this new technology. So with the arrival of the train, for example, with the arrival of the telephone, with the arrival of e every technology, is somebody saying it's the end of uh, humanity? Of course, we are arguing it's the beginning of a new uh, 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 humanity. But I think that uh, what it would mean, for example, homo electronicus or electronico domestico, nobody is really fully uh, uh, describing this. And this is why we have the symposium tomorrow. Of course, at some level, we all know the world changed with social media. Uh, uh, without social media, no Donald Trump, and that would be good, right? So, so, so we know that our life now changed because of this thing, that we are no longer what we were before, but have we developed a way to understand it, a way to talk about it, a way to even think about it? Do we even really know what is this new species we have become? I think uh, not, but I think it goes back to Beatrice's ideas about the, about the anesthetic, the, you know, the, the, uh, reaction to technology. The reaction to technology. Yeah, I suppose I'm super interested in the react. You know, I agree with uh, everything that Mark said about the fact that with every new technology, there are all these uh, pronouncements about uh, how this is the end of everything. You know, for for example, if you think about the arrival of photography or the arrival of the illustrated architectural magazine to keep it in the design realm. There are all these architects that emerge uh, immediately, like Adolf Loos, and that start uh, criticizing their contemporaries because they are producing work that only looks good in photographs and only... But right now I'm less interested in what people say than on the physiological reactions to all of them. So, for example, when Mark mentioned the train, yeah, the train was a big shock, and I was thinking about how... Miss, for example, which is again one of these stories that always suppressed in architectural history. So I just give it to you to give you a sense of the things that we are missing. When Miss um, went from his natal town in Aachen, which is a small city in Germany, to Berlin to get his first job, he talks about uh, taking the, the, the train at nine o'clock and how at 9.05 it's already, has already opened the, the window and is throwing up, is vomiting, right? So we don't normally associate, I mean, that was very interesting to me because I thought to myself, we don't associate uh, trains with uh, motion sickness anymore. How fascinating that he describes this, uh, this new machine that is taking him to Berlin in, in, and also oh. the fear, I suppose, of leaving his, in those terms, and then he describes arriving in, 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 in Berlin and taking a tram and again vomiting again, and then getting out of the tram and finally getting to Peter Berens' uh, office, walking. 
I thought to myself, why is this always suppressed in the history? We know that oh, in all the stories they will tell you that Peter Bere, that uh, Mies was born in this uh, town, that he was the son of a stain mason, and that one day he went to Berlin and started working for whatever, for mm. Peter Berens. So, so, but what about all the story in the middle? What about all these uh, unbelievable uh, reactions? And I think this is, uh, uh, this is uh, something that goes back to what we were talking about. Uh, before that, uh, um, and also in, 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 in technology, that also, te and with harm, for example, and with mm. the age of the burnout, uh, syndrome or the hyper, uh, environmentally uh, sensitive, that the, all these, uh, reactions, uh, that we have with our body, the bodies that, the way our bodies are speaking, are also super interesting in relation to the, not just what we say about it. Right? Mm. But maybe just to, because I, I suppose we, we come to the end, but it, I mean, we are not sitting up here like this is what the human species should do. Like, it's a question, and you, you ask a question. We are also asking the question. For me, the pleasure of listening to, to Ingo is, is I feel like everything we thought has to change because his way of thinking the question love changes everything. So we could try to answer your question thinking what does a digital swarm mean in terms of the concept and reality uh, of, of love. We just feel like these are the kinds of questions that sh that designers should, should, be, should be asking. When you talk to designers, uh, they always say that they love humans. They always say they take care of humans. So for example, if there is a problem with electronic uh, space, the designer will somehow create uh, the right response for humans. Actually designers hate humans. If you really think about it, architects for example, they never like what the humans do to their projects. When they make pictures of the buildings, they put the different furniture in there. They never go back and say to the to the client, "So, are you happy?" Right? They, uh, so they say they love the human, but actually what they would like to do is to redesign the client. Right? Every designer, if a famous British designer makes a very nice uh, coffee pot, the idea is if you, if you use this coffee pot, you become a better human being. That's why you spend a little bit of money. Uh, so design means better human. So d d that's somebody who wants to make a better human. This is where the fascism that Ingo is referring to, this, this desire to make a better human, normally it's a kind of, uh, a con controlling desire. So we, what we say is actually designers are always trying to redesign the human. If this is the case, okay, fine. That's good. That's very human to redesign the human. But let's be sure that we know that this is what we're doing. So let's try to understand what is a human and what is design. And we feel like these two concepts have completely uh, fallen away. The word design has become so common and so popular that it has no meaning. And the word human has become a kind of avatar, uh, a kind of uh, 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 a word used usually when somebody is making a kind of a gesture of force. You know, what's human, what's inhuman, what is the rule, what is the regulation. So I just think we, we, are, we have talked enough to you and we, we're try, trying to communicate that just as you are asking a question and maybe we could offer you some answer, we are listening to Ingo thinking we have to change our uh, way of thinking, and we, we think at least uh, 20 years of this kind of conversation could produce a new concept of design. Remember, in, more or less in the 1850s, the, the, the British are trying to make design. They think the Germans and the Austrians are much better. So they send cultural spies to try to find out how they are jealous. Uh, they do the great world's fair. They do all the fairs. They are completely jealous. I mean, jealousy could be a really big subject for design. Eventually, by the end of the 19th century, somehow the Germans have become jealous of the English and they mm. send co mm. cultural spies to England. How come these mm. guys are so good? What are the stakes? Very high. Who will be selling products in the global market? So the, so the concept of, of design uh, uh, evolves over many, many generations and many, many debates and so on, and it's completely tied into politics and religion and the market and so on. And only by more or less the 1920s is this concept of good design really kind of fixed and established in, in Bauhaus, in, in, in Germany, back in Germany. And then it has almost not changed in 100 years. So we now are using a concept of, of design that is, is an antique.
When you go to a design museum, you should see the concept of design sitting there like an old object, and you should look at it and go like, oh, what a strange idea about design that they had back in 1920. But no, it's the very, very same idea that dominates design magazines, design schools, design marketplace today. So we really think it has to be some kind of revolution in thinking, um, and, and uh, we are not like... Uh, the leaders of a revolution, but we would like to participate. So the moment Inger says an army of love, okay, sounds revolution to me. It sounds like an army to, to join. And I think it is like this. I think it's some kind of a battle. Even you use the word electronics as if we know what that means. I mean, the word electronics arrives with transistors in a very particular moment of the history of technology. Is it still, still a good word? For example, if you use the word electronics and you're working for Apple or for Facebook and you say electronics, they probably look at you like you're a strange uh, creature because nothing is electric. Actually, nothing today is, let's say, electronic. We left, the, we left electronics behind maybe 50 years ago. And one last thought. More or less in, in the 1920s, Modern architects thought that they could finally address the transformations that occurred in the 1850s, steel and glass, that we were 75 years late, right? Uh, okay, so we are late again. Uh, it doesn't mean we have to be stupid. And I think this project is started as a kind of stupidity reduction project. We don't give you the answer, but we try to make many existing answers look stupid. Um, and I think your question does that for us because we I don't have the answer I guess yeah I guess more um, questions and answers non-answers tomorrow, tomorrow. 10 yep. at 10 o'clock maybe Ivan you're the conferencier please well we have the books available here and on the other hand, we'll continue with this marathon. Keep calm, there will be uh, coffee breaks to have lunch, okay? And we'll start at 10 o'clock, okay? The interpreter apologizes, but we can't hear the speaker because she's not using the mic. Okay, so we'll split up the session. Tomorrow we'll start at 10. It will be from 10 o'clock. We'll have a break at 11. To give the floor to the first uh, round tables, conferences. After that, at one, we'll have another break. We'll be back at three, and until five o'clock. From five to five thirty, another break, and until seven thirty. Yes, there's a there's an agenda outside. You can you can pick it up, but we will make breaks. Okay. Thank you.